Okay, so moving on. Um, so hopefully we recall this from chapter eight, right? A nice classic review. I'm just going to kind of just remind you of the few things that we came up with for our, you know, our particle on a ring model. So we use this to describe um, an electron rotating around a proton, and that model worked really well. Um, we could also use this exact same model to describe a, you know, molecule with one mass on a spring and a molecule with another mass rotating about each other. Okay, so we could apply that to the electron proton system, or we could apply this to our rotors, our actual molecules. Okay, so recall the classical kinetic energy is given by p squared 2m. Um, the angular momentum classical is given by plus minus uh, momentum cross r, right? And we remember that when it's um, with our right hand rule, when it's pointing in the right, uh, when it's, excuse me, when it's rotating. Um, I've blanked out here. When my thumb is pointing up, it's rotating this way. Um, and so the angular momentum goes up when it's rotating in this orientation, and the angular momentum points down when it's rotating um, in the opposite orientation. Okay. So I equals mr squared for simple rotors. So that would be a linear rotor and nothing else. All of the other rotors have much more complicated moments of inertia. Okay. And so what's important to note when we solved Schrodinger, okay, right? H psi equals E psi. This is the solution that we got for energy. L times L plus one times H bar squared over two times I. Okay. Um, well, that's for a single electron. That's the single electron solution. When we apply this to our, our actual rotors, like HCl, for example, that's a multi-electron situation, okay? And so for a multi-electron, recall we have to use quantum number J, um, which is capital L plus capital S, um, and we remember that capital L is, uh, right, the Klebsch-Gordon series for all of the small l values, okay? So what's important is what we can show um, when we apply this to multi-electron systems, all right, then simply this solution can just become E equals big J times J plus one times H bar squared over two I where j can take on values 0, 1, 2, etc. Okay? And this j right here is going to represent our rotational quantum number. Okay? And so again, if we were dealing with complicated rotors um, where you know we have to take the sum of all of these individual moments, our energy solution would also have a sum. We would have to sum our um, J values over all of those varying moments of inertia. We're just going to stick with the simple examples so that we don't have to carry out that sum. Um, and also because it's, it's an easier demonstration. Okay. So let's move on. Okay. So we note that E sub J equals J times J plus one H bar squared over moments of inertia. So as it turns out, this collection of constants, h bar squared over 2i, is what we call the rotational constant. And this is given in joules, right? So if I use um, kilograms and meters squared and joules for h bar, I'll have b in joules, OK? Um, so now we're going to come back to this nomenclature that I introduced at the very beginning of the semester. When we put a little tilde on there, that's the rotational constant in wave number. And we can get to the, um, so we can always convert an energy into a wave number by multiplying by HC. So if I say HC times B 
equals h bar squared over 2i and rearrange this equation, uh, this is where this comes from, okay? So as you can see, I divide the hc over, um, and so that's going to be h bar squared over 2 hc over i, um, and now it becomes convenient to try and absorb some of these constants, right, to absorb the h's together. So I'll leave one h bar here and one h bar here. Um, excuse me, I'm going to make that um, just an h, rather, because we know that um, h bar is equal to h divided by 2 pi, okay? Well, then there's another 2 and another hc over i, so that means this h and this h cancel, and then that's where I get the 4 pi uh, ci um, under h bar, okay? And of course, I would have to have my, um, all of this would actually come out in inverse meters, right? And so then I would have to either use all of my distance units as centimeters, or I calculate it in inverse meters and then multiply by that factor 100 centimeters in one meter, okay? So now if we look at the rotational energy levels in joules, right, that will be given by J times J plus one times B. Um, and we'll use the letter F to denote the rotational energy levels in wave numbers. And that will be also J times J plus one times the B tilde, right, the, the rotational constant in wave numbers. Um, and let's see here. Yes, and so, of course, right, to get the an actual energy level diagram, what we recognize in spectroscopy is going to be the difference in energy levels, okay? And so that difference in energy levels will be given by Ej final minus Ej initial, all right? Um, and so let me see what I have coming up next. Um, yes, okay, so let's keep walking through this. Okay, and so I just want to show you an example of this. So if I say J equals zero, that's going to be my ground state. Um, and I know that that's going to have an energy of zero if I apply that J zero through this term, right? Okay, so now what about the next level? Well, that's going to be a J equals one. Um, and if I make j equal to 1, you know, 1 plus 1 is 2 times 1 is 2. So that's 2 times b. And so the difference right between these energy levels will be uh, 2 times b. So now what about the j equals 2 level? Okay. Well, the j equals 2 level is 2 plus 1 is 3 times 2 is 6. So that's 6b. And the difference between these two energy levels is now 4b. Let's keep going with this thing. j equals 3. This is probably as high as I can go on my picture here. So if j is equal to 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, times 3 is 12. Okay, 12b. Um, and the difference between these levels is now 6b. Okay, so this is where this gets a little confusing because you might expect now your rotational level diagram to have increasing energy spacings but what we have to remember is there's a population of states of rotational levels right so if i look at the j um, the nomenclature of this goes j10 so we're talking about transitions from zero to one okay so we get that to be 2b. Well, what about the j21 state? All right. Well, we know that that's going to be 4b. The difference between these two is 2b. Okay. So let's look at the next one. j3 to 2. Um, and so we know that one is 6b. But look, the difference between these two is 2b, all right? And if we were to keep going up, we would see this constant 2b difference, 2 times b, between each level. So each level is growing by 2 times b. And because our 
molecules will have a population of rotational states. In other words, before we even excite this molecule with microwave energy, it's already going to have populations in level 3, level 2, level 1, level 0. And so what that means is we're going to see a spectrum with spacings every two times b. Okay? And I'll show you that here.